Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, workshop that's uh, exploring exploring sort of what networks are really and how do we activate and energize uh, networks that are, we, we, we ended up using the word networks that are um, inclusive and effective. Uh, and I realized I was sometimes using the word impactful instead of effective, you know, that actually are doing something, whatever it is that uh, networks can achieve. Um, so we're, we're, it's really great to see you here. We're also conscious uh, that it's not, we, we were wondering how many people would arrive and it's not, um, there's quite a number of people on this call who are, who are contributing in some way, telling stories, bringing experience, bringing um, resources. And uh, I think we slightly outnumber the number of you who have showed up as participants. But what we thought we'd do was we'll have a sort of open conversation with you about what we do about that. Um, uh, the idea that we were sort of coming towards, uh, the, those of us who are, have sort of designed this session, was that we might do a slightly slimmed down version of it. So not for the full three and a half hours, but certainly sort of sharing some of the content that's been um, prepared, because it will also then be in the recording. Um, so we know that that people are interested in uh, looking at these things after after the event. Um, I think the sort of risk I was trying to think through in my head, well, what does that mean for those of you who have shown up? Um, I think there's a sort of risk that you get it all feels a bit broadcast and you don't get to have the interaction that we were explicitly designing this this session to be about. Uh, so I certainly don't want to do something that means that you don't feel like you've got any voice. <laughs> um, uh, but it might be that we could do a sort of slightly shortened version, not go into breakout groups in the same way, but still open up for questions and comments from everyone who's here in this room. I know Rakesh, you've already sent me a message to say that you're, you, you're only with us for 20 minutes. <coughs> it may be that others of you were, were actually planning to leave at some point, but I just want to, um, before we go any further, just to ask if there are any comments, suggestions, concerns about if we do that a slightly reduced focus on the content, but open up at points for contributions. How does that feel for everybody? I'm seeing some thumbs up. I'm now going to cough. Hang on a second. While Sarah is is doing that, um, is taking a bit of water and taking a moment. Yeah, um, uh, David, great to see you sort of introduce yourself in the chat there. Do go ahead and do that. It's always good to see where people are in the world and what their kind of projects they're involved in. So do go ahead and do that, folks. Yes, and actually, I think um, so. So, on the basis of your consent to our slightly adapted version of this workshop, uh, I'm going to invite all of you to to say something in the chat. Um, I'm going to invite you to tell us uh, who you are, um, where you're from, and uh, something about um, any networks that you're part of. I mean. I mean, you might feel, well, there's a ridiculous list. And I'm not going to list them all in the chat, but I guess networks that you've really got in mind as, if any, as you come into this session, um, just so we get a sense. And, and I guess if you have roles, you know, if you're actually coordinating networks or playing a particular role in networks, or you might be somebody who is pretty wary of networks and tends not to get involved. I'd love to hear, have a sense of, of who you are in relationship to, to networks. So tell us something in the chat. I'm really enjoying the thought of Railway Street Gardens. Thank you, Jeanette. <laughs> what a great name. Uh, okay, and I'll, as, as you're doing that, I'll, I'll just tell you a bit about our intentions for, for the session. We really want to um, support honest sharing of experiences about networks um, and learning from each other. Um, 
we're hoping that some of us, we're, we're imagining that some of us are people who are already pretty active in networks. Um, and we're wanting to sort of support those of us who are active in networks to just take a bit of a bird's eye view. Um, it's very easy to be in the midst of it all. I know I speak for myself. Um, sometimes I can be so busy thinking about what, what's the next thing we're going to send out, what's the next thing we're going to invite people to, uh, that I, I can lose track of, well, what actually are we trying to achieve through all of this and how are we doing? So we're, we want to sort of support us all to do that bit of a sort of zoom out. Um, yeah, I think, I think David, you suggested to me, rather than the stepping away, it was more of the bird's eye view looking down. I liked, I liked that image. Uh, we also know that not everybody is active in, in networks and there's a really important learning to be had from those people too. Um, so we're inviting people to consider why might I join a network? Um, how might it benefit me, my group, my community? Uh, one of the things that I think may be familiar to lots of us working in networks is that sense of people are really, you know, already giving a huge amount of time and energy to a particular project, a particular place. And actually, they don't have a lot to spare for um, networking on a different scale. So it's really important to think about, well, what, what would that network, what could a network offer them? And how could they contribute in a way that is is nourishing and not exhausting? Uh, we're going to try between us all to offer some some language, some models, some resources that might help us help us all um, develop and sustain inclusive and effective networks. And the final intention I, I wanted to share openly with you as well is to bring a bit of a, a lightness, playfulness to the to the process um, and support all of us to make good choices about where we're putting our energy and what to leave for another pe other people another time um, I'm, I'm a sort of personal intention from me around actually probably most of the things that I facilitate but certainly this this if this workshop is not to add to people's to-do list and increase their sense of obligation um, but hopefully to, to leave you feeling inspired supported and with a sense of a potential um, that you want to there's you know there are some things that you want to do uh, so when we're sharing these models uh, I'm going to really invite all of us not to treat this as these are all things I should be doing and if I'm not doing it I'm somehow failing in my role as a network weaver. Instead there are possibilities for you and your other network members to consider about whether this might be useful, whether you've got the appetite to do something slightly different at this point. So those are the intentions. And I guess, uh, yeah, in, in bringing that intention to have for you to leave this session feeling nourished and connected, I'm really thinking that that's, that's often, and in, you know, this is fractal, when we're working in our networks, that's often an, an intention I would suggest that we bring to our events and our activities. How do we support people to come in to connect to collaborate with other people and leave feeling nourished rather than drained by the experience uh, i'm loving the info that people are putting up there in the chat uh, no worries if you're not able to join by video it's great that you're with us um okay so i'm just going to do um a little bit more input about um uh, some language, some, 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 a model that might help as we think about networks in this, in this workshop. I'll do that very briefly. I'm going to share my screen. Let me make sure I do this in a good way. Uh, so I'm hoping you now see a rather beautiful murmuration of birds 
forming the shape of a bird. I don't know whether the photo was doctored. It's not my photo, but it's really impressive. If it, and I have seen something similar in real life. Um, uh, and I want to start by saying, um, I'm going to share some slides, but these are actually a number of these are borrowed by my friend and colleague, uh, Peter Lafort, who some of you may know, who's, I think, um, has got, done some really interesting um, thinking and has really interesting experience of networks. So I want to acknowledge that and appreciate him for sharing these with us. Um, so I guess um, I'm, I'm not gonna try and define networks. I want to do a cheerful disclaimer that I feel like I'm a practitioner rather than a deep thinker about networks. Um, and I, know that there's really interesting research and thinking around the qualities of networks, what they are, how they how they form, what what needs what is needed to support them. There may well be more experience on this in this in this room uh, than is represented in me. So we'll we'll hear from other people. Um, but here's some thoughts that might help. Uh, networks are about connections. Um, group of people connecting um, around some form of common interest. But there's huge variety in what that looks like, you know, from the, from the very formal, very rigid, uh, uh, very structured to incredibly loose networks that, uh, you know, very organic form in a moment disappear. You know, so, so it doesn't feel like there's one pattern of networks that we're, um, we'll be exploring today or that we're suggesting is the right form. Um, and there, but, but it is, I would suggest about connections and the complexity of those connections can, can vary as well. Uh, so uh, it can be incredibly complex, lots and lots of interrelationships, uh, different roles being played. I mean, this is a, that, that on the left is a, a model of the relationships that uh, are occurring in the, um, play Romeo and Juliet. Uh, lots of complexity there. It can be as simple as it's a it's a mailing list. You know, it's 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 quite it's a network that's pretty much in broadcast mode. These are the people who receive this mailing list. There's not a lot of interaction going on beyond that. So they, I, I guess those are two, two ends of the spectrum. Um, Peter uh, suggested that we might want to just think about uh, the social capital model as a way of a way of understanding or a lens to look at networks through and thinking about well, what sort of connections are present in a network. And here's three sorts of connections that um, uh, that have been defined. Um, uh, bonding connections. So these are bonds between people that are uh, horizontal, equal, um, pretty defined, um, and where there's a really clear perceived connection. So people who see themselves as all part of something together. Um, so there's quite strong bonds. Bridging connections uh, can be horizontal across uh, levels of power or influence, across so uh, or horizontal. Uh, they can be across social divides, but but bridges sort of by definition are across a perceived gap. You know, there's some difference here that's being bridged. Um, and linking uh, connections are about explicitly trying to link differences in power. And it certainly helped me when uh, we then, Peter then talked about it in terms of, well, what, what might this look like in real life? A community uh, group would have lots of strong um, bonds, bonding connections. They're all part of this community. They all belong to this place, um, and it's and it's largely horizontal bonds. Um, uh, a network that includes a number of community groups in different contexts in different places would be bridging those communities sometimes across quite significant differences. I was really interested, Phil, in the conversation you started in, in Vive about uh, uh, the differences between rural communities and urban uh, and you know, the, the sort of um, differences there, but also the, the, the common challenges as well as the, 
the um, the different challenges. So that you know, a network that bridged rural, urban, different geographical contexts uh, would have lots of bridging links. And then um, linking is often whether you're talking about explicit power gaps. It's something where you're trying to work across power. So it might be linking between uh, uh, funders and beneficiaries, a network that, that, that includes those sort of links, uh, politicians and community groups, um, those sort of things where there are explicit power differences, but people are trying to work together or network in, in, in a particular way. And those power differences can really show up in the network. And then the other piece that, that um, Peter uh, shared with us was this idea that there may be uh, particular values present in a network and it's quite interesting to reflect on how strong are these values and and how much do we embed them in embed embody them in our network so values of shared understanding you know do we have together um, a shared idea about why we are in this network how clear is that across the membership about our, our purpose and the way that we work together um, reciprocity, uh, so that sense of do members have the opportunity to give to the network as well as to receive from it? Uh, do they have a clear sense of how their contribution is welcome, what, what, what they can offer, as well as the benefits that they'll receive? And trust, you know, how much in this network do, do members really believe that other members are also acting in their, in the network's best interest? So to serve the, 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 the network's purpose. So I don't know um, how those land for you as a way of thinking about networks. I, I certainly found them very helpful. So I'm gonna invite you all just to have a little moment thinking about a network that you're involved in. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a diagram numbers sort of person, you might even want to draw, draw a diagram like this with the the three values, reciprocity, trust, and shared understanding, and the, the three types of links, bonding, bridging, and linking. And just reflect a bit about um, a network that you're part of. I'm going to stop sharing, but I can go back to that um, diagram any, any time you want me to. Um, and inviting you to think, um, how you how you describe the purpose of a particular network that you're involved in how how clear is that to you you know how easy is it for you to describe the purpose and how strong do you see those different types of connections bonding bridging and linking within your network and how would you assess the extent to which the network embodies those three values shared understanding, reciprocity and trust. This is a moment where I'm going to just invite um, contributions from anyone. Um, you don't have to share about your, you, know, you don't have to share about your network. I'd be interested to know if, um, if that felt helpful as a way of thinking about networks. And uh, it's absolutely fine to say not at all. <laughs> How was that helpful as a way of thinking about networks? And, and did you did that give you any in, insights about a particular network that you're involved in? So inviting anyone to say something about that. Carolina's showing us a picture, but I couldn't see it properly. Do you want to tell us a bit about it, Carolina? Yeah, sure. Um, I just realized that, yeah, you can't. I don't know, the background's blurry, so you can't see. Um, yeah, actually, I was doing it on the control shift networks that I'm part of. And I think the main, like, we're, this is my perception of it. We're quite high on most of those criteria. But the bridging, it was actually quite interesting. Like, people who are not of our community, as it were, um, it's a bit difficult because I guess we're a collection of organizations involved in environmentalism political decentralization and community wealth building. So in a sense, we are kind of cross community, but I think that that could be widened 
um, to involve like other aspects of systems change. So yeah, I found that quite useful to, to think about it in this way. Um, I think we're strong on the values, uh, but maybe we could you know, look a bit more across communities and also thinking about how we engage with power as well. So yeah, thanks. I, I enjoyed that exercise. Thank you. Any other contributions that people want to make? Either written in chat or, chat or just put your hand up or, and speak. I could definitely offer an observation when I was doing the, um, I did it for a local community garden network that I'm involved in here in Southwest London. And I found myself thinking we're quite strong on most of that, but actually a lot of them are very dynamic across the group and in different situations, particularly like um, shared understanding, community gardening, but it's in a primary school, so it's a child-led community garden. So that has lots of different ways it can be manifest, the idea of being child-led. Um, yeah, and even trust in one situation, there's very rich trust. In another situation, it feels like the trust is gone. And we're in a moment of conflict so it's interesting how it it's clear and not clear at the same time but that's very telling it's very nice exercise simple exercise to get into in order to sort of realize that you know yeah that's me it's interesting rich that makes me think of um something i was planning to cover in the governance i was going to do a little um breakout session around governance and um, and part of that for me is how do those who are sort of holding the network, how do they, how good are they at keeping that sense of where are we right now? You know, what are the, what's the current energy levels, current relationships, and uh, what might need to be adjusted to respond to current needs, current opportunities, current context? Because uh, I think you're absolutely right that it, none of this is fixed and it can, it can change really quite rapidly in some circumstances. Any other thoughts from anyone that they want to share at this point? Yeah, thank you. So, so to the network that I'm thinking of is, we set up a high peak green network in Derbyshire and it was for all transition type groups to come together and, and connect. And, and that morphed into the um, Borough Council declaring a climate emergency and, and us acting as a bridge between communities and the council. So that's kind of what our, our purpose, our rough purpose is. But it's kind of, I was going to make the similar point to, to what Richard said, that there are areas within that of trust and there are areas of, of common understanding, but there's also areas of um, there are places where we don't have a common understanding and and it's quite interesting that how we spend more time in the areas where we've got trust and understanding but then we kind of keep away a little bit they're almost like forbidden areas we don't like to go to those areas where there isn't that trust and there isn't that understanding and again that can fluctuate depending on what we're doing but in terms of there being uh, what did i write down now um in terms of there being a shared understanding it feels like there's numerous shared understandings but there's also numerous shared misunderstandings um, and, and so it's not, you know, I was thinking, is there, is there a, a sentence I could say, is there a line that I could describe that particular network? And there isn't. There's lots of lines that, that I could describe it. And that changes as we move and it is very fluid. And, and it almost feels like, the, the under, for me, the way I'm thinking about this is that understanding, and I, I've approached this piece of work here, look, starting with trust and understanding. And then I've gone on to the areas um, of bonding and, and, and bridging. So I've kind of, I, I looked at that first and then kind of went down to the other bits. And, and it felt like each tentacle of the, 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 the bridging and the bonding, that was different depending on where we started off with understanding and trust. Um, so that's my observation from, from the network that I'm involved in anyway. I guess I can't resist a question about have you noticed anything that helps you? It, it, I, I heard you say there was there were areas that you sort of know not to to go into because they can. They've. I'm I'm, I'm imagining there's some sort of charge or potential for 
um, for people to be pursuing diff, you know, different objectives or something like that. I, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, have you had any experience of, of, of pushing your comfort zones there and, and how did that work? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm, I quite like pushing comfort zones, right? And I, and I quite just gen, gently nudging at, at, the, at the boundaries and just seeing how far we can go and how comfortable we are. Um, so there are, yeah, I mean, I can think of examples where we, we've kind of gone to a point and then we've backed off a little bit as, as a network. There's an understanding that right, we, we need to back off a little bit because, because there, there isn't an agreement on the direction that we're going in. And that feels like a real push to, to, to bring the groups together to actually work out something that feels comfortable, that there's a consent to, to, to a particular part of, of the organization that feels a little bit uncomfortable. So, and again, it, it comes down to resources and time and, and all those sorts of things, all the practicalities come into play. I think and that's, that feels like it may take time to work through that and I don't think we've got time so let's leave that part of the network let's leave part of that uh, part of the process and and instead we'll we'll do the slightly easier bit because time does not permit us to to go into that because we can see that that's a bit of a a, a slightly darker place um so yeah I, I, and I and as I've been doing this exercise I'm kind of thinking yeah we okay that's interesting we back off we back off from having those conversations a little bit. And that, you know, as someone who likes to gently nudge, that feels a little bit frustrating at times. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. And there's something that's coming up for me about, um, that, that I've heard from a couple of the contributions around, uh, so networks being, um, I mean, they're, they're rooted in relationships aren't they? And they're rooted in, and they're de by definition, therefore they're dynamic and they're organic. Uh, and there's something for me about how do you design, if you, if you are designing a network, how do you accommodate that, you know, so, so, so that it isn't about, uh, yeah, how can you accommodate and create spaces and co enable connections to be made uh, that, Will allow stuff to happen that you haven't necessarily imagined yet you know that, that but at least puts people into relationship with each other in a way that um, enables things to arise uh okay i'm going to move on um and we're going to do, just have um three uh little stories mini stories from three um uh, you know, very different networks in some ways, different contexts, etc. Um, and uh, just sort of hear what that prompts in in each of us. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, Nick, who's going to tell us a story about the Herefordshire Green Network. Go ahead, Nick. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, we do get Herefordshire confused with Hertfordshire, so I just want to put a bit of context. We're, we're the county that's over by the Welsh border. We have the same population as Portsmouth City, about 190,000 people, but spread over 840 square miles, and only three communities with more than 10,000 people, of which the largest by far is the city of Hereford of about 60,000. So most of us, myself included, live in small villages, typically of less than 500 people. And the issue for us is not that there are people passionate about the climate and ecological emergency, it's about how we create enough critical mass outside of the city and the market towns to actually get anything done. Um, and that's what we've been working on. And we've been going in various guises for over a decade now. And we've got about 80 members, um, but some of those are big hitters. So the Wildlife Trust belong to the Green Network. They've got 6,000 members of their own. We've got CPRE, Extinction Rebellion, and so on. So it's, it's quite an eclectic group. And in 2019, we launched the Great Collaboration, which um, was targeted at our town and parish councils that had declared a climate and ecological emergency, but then sat there thinking, so what does it mean and what do we do? And we had a series of road shows. We went out with a, with a group of sort of experts in the field, I suppose. We got over 50% of our parishes attending one of the road shows, 
Then COVID hit and it's sort of basically gone online and is continuing as a web-based toolkit. Um, and that's where we've been putting our efforts. So it's, it is really targeted at these very small communities where there are enough people that want to do something, but it isn't obvious necessarily what they can do and or they don't have the infrastructure to support them. Uh, and just to give you another example, there are four railway stations in the whole of Herefordshire. So when you have a debate about public transport, you know, it's a slightly different context, perhaps from London and, and Birmingham. But the great collaboration has been going great guns. And what's also exciting is that we've now launched a, a joint initiative with the University of Warwick, which is doing a similar thing. So we feel as if we're also getting some external help and some real power behind it, which is helping us. And the final thing I want to leave, which is the optimistic note, is that the alignments are developing that weren't there five years ago. Herefordshire Council has declared a climate emergency five years ago, it hadn't. The local diocese and the Methodists have adopted exactly the same target, zero carbon by 2030. So we've got four pilot projects going with the diocese. And I think we were all sort of pretty disgruntled and a bit dis, you know, disillusioned just two years ago in the middle of COVID, but it's a feeling that things at last are beginning to change and God knows it need to. Anyway, that's my story, our story. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, I feel myself bubbling over with questions about that, but what I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, have go to each of three stories and then come back to the group as a whole. So if you, um, you have questions, they might be questions that you pose to one person or to, or to all of us. Uh, so I'm going to go now to you, Richard, who you're going to talk about. I'm actually, I'm not going to assume what you're going to talk about. You can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And just to let you know in supporting the session, I'll pop links to the networks and whatnot in the chat a bit later. So I changed my hat uh, to presentation uh, mode. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the London hub. So from the countryside of Herefordshire to a city of up to 9 million people, I reckon it's around 200 square miles, something like that, but so different to Herefordshire. Um, and I haven't done the station count. That would have been an interesting, consistent stat, wouldn't it, from one presentation to another? I'm sure it's in the hundreds, if not thousands. 300 languages across London spoken. So why do I say stuff like that? This is what it looks like. I've got some props. This is what it looks like as well. Slightly more DIY than a PowerPoint presentation, but there you go. And all of those dots on there, if you can hear me still, all of those dots on there, slightly old view of the 42 transition towns within the M25. So there it is, the big smoke. I'll pop that down, come back to the camera. So yeah, 42, I had a look this morning on Transition Network's website, 42 transition towns inside the M25. So this is different to Herefordshire Green Network in a few ways. We're talking about a transition, um, uh, transition towns network. Why? Because there's huge, you might say competition, you might say it's just a very busy space with that many people, that many languages. You imagine the amount of cultures or how people might self-identify their culture within London. There's a lot going on. So we went, oh, what would it be like to start a transition connection of transition towns? What would that look like? So I can't uh, attest to the beginning of the story. I came in a little bit later, about five years ago. And we asked the question, what would it be like for a hub of transition towns, not only across London, initially we said across London and the southeast. And that's what it looked like in London, but we had a number of people coming in from Lewis, from Hastings, from up in St Albans and whatnot. And we started this conversation about, okay, so what is the purpose of our hub? What would that be like? And I've got another prop. So this, this is what we ended up uh, after lots of conversation, this is what we ended up with. This is, that is the famous flip chart. I also, also almost should wear gloves, you know, exhibition gloves while holding it. And there's seven things that emerged as the purpose of this network. 
The first was sharing. So this relates to bonding, peer-to-peer -peer sharing that um, as Sarah mapped out in terms of those different ways to understand networks. What's it like if we get together 10, 12 transition towns and simply share our activity face-to-face? -face? The second one is support, very related to that. So people would come with going, oh, we've got a real challenge about this, or we want to do a community fridge, but we haven't done it before come into this space and perhaps you can reach out for support. And indeed, there was quite a lot of support about the difficulties and conflicts within transition groups as well. The third is celebration, this real kind of DNA of transition, the idea of celebrating what we're doing, saying, hey, if you're just planting up an area that wasn't planted up before by your local station and sticking a stick in it and saying, does anyone else want to do this with us? Fantastic. This is part of the billions of small activities that build the change we want to see. The fourth is being part of a bigger picture. So the idea of not feeling, I don't know if anyone on this call has felt pretty alone in the activities they're doing. What difference can I make on my own? Indeed, that's something we found in transition towns as well. But when you get together and start to hear the other stories around that circle, I always loved starting some of these circles with going, what's the one thing you're most proud of in your group? And you go around 15, 20 people, and by the end of it, your mind was blown by this, the complete story of change that 20 groups hold or 20 individuals hold. The fifth is light touch structure. So the idea of us not burdening ourselves with very, very heavy structure, but saying how light footed can we be in structure and organization? The next, which came up later, was connection with other movements. So this maybe relates to bridging or linking in terms of those models we talked about earlier. Do we have capacity to go library of things? There's quite a lot of them in London and the library of things organization is based, started in London. Would it be interesting to link with them a bit closer, come into partnership relationship with them? Loads of other groups in London, like I was saying, it's a very busy space. And the last one was communicate, this idea of internal communication or indeed what kind of communication can we put out there? So these were the seven like pillars, if you like. I'm coming on five minutes now, so I'll, I'll try and kind of paint the picture a little bit more. What did that look like in practice? Well, four meetings a year. This is what capacity the volunteer core group had to run four meetings a year. And indeed we accessed some resource to pay for the facilitation and design of those meetings. Uh, da, da, da. So yeah, and the other thing we did five years ago was an activity called Reconomy Lift. So this was about 70, 80 people in a room. So this was a big moment, a bit like the summit of attracting lots of people to one place and it looked like this. And was a really good place to kind of go, hey, get into a room, hear some really inspiring stories of how we invent the new economy, and then go into a Skillshare place to start learning how to build your organizational structure or develop your brand or things like this. That was really exciting, but it was five years ago. So some of the challenges about sustaining this network over time, for me, I really observed renewal is really, really important. The core group, and indeed I've stepped a little bit away from it now personally. Why? Because I felt like I was carrying too much. So that's about my personal well-being, as well as the notion of where the power lies in our core groups. So renewal feels really important. How do you keep new energy and indeed more and more diverse energy coming into the middle to hold the middle? Uh, very key to that is the value of the network itself. Why would someone come in the middle if they didn't sense a value and a purpose of the network? And the second thing for me is a regular offer. We were kind of figuring out dates one by one a little bit in those meetings. For me, I think a regular offer to go, we're going to be here. This is where we're going to be. It's purposeful. There's a reason for you to be here and we'll see you in the same place next month. There's something about that and certainly in local groups, I feel that too. So that's a little bit in seven minutes about the, uh, perhaps I nicked uh, Nick Reed's uh, additional minutes there, but a little bit about the London hub. Uh, I'm now going to uh, go to Philip, who's going to talk to us about a different network. Go ahead, Phil. Um, yeah, I, I'm Philip Revel from the Scottish Communities Climate Action Network. Uh, and I just quickly Googled it and there's 359 stations in Scotland. For a population of five million or so, I think. 
Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to very briefly try and tell you a little bit of the story of the Scottish Communities Climate Action Network, which is a bit of a mouthful, so we normally just call it SCAN. Um, and our um, purpose is to support community-led action to address the climate and nature emergency and work for a just, thriving and resilient Scotland. Um, but just a little bit of background. Um, we incorporate the Transition Scotland hub as well. Um, a little bit of background that the scan really came about in 2012. Um, in Scotland, we were fortunate. I mean, in some ways it was a mixed blessing, but um, in some ways it was very positive. In 2008, the Scottish government under pressure from the Green Party uh, introduced something called the Climate Challenge Fund, uh, which funded community groups to run projects to start um, addressing climate change, uh, but with a very strong focus on cutting carbon. Um, so SCAN came about really because the, the Climate Challenge Fund was run by an organization called Keep Scotland Beautiful, um, but we, we felt there's a real need for a peer-to-peer -peer network. So some groups which had had funding from the Climate Challenge Fund got together to support each other, basically. Uh, and the aim was always very much mutual support and inspiration, but also to link particularly with the Scottish Government to try and lobby the Scottish Government and communicate to the Scottish Government um, to put in place better policies to make it much easier to take action from the bottom up, because we were aware that community-led action faced a huge number of barriers, which made it much more difficult than it should have been and still is actually. Um, early on, SEMVO, the, the Council for Ethnic Minority Voluntary Organisations in Scotland, lobbied the Scottish Government uh, that a proportion of the Climate Challenge Fund should be allocated to communities facing disadvantage, and particularly ethnic minority communities. So that, that was very positive in many ways because it, it immediately meant that um, it, it attracted a very diverse group of groups. Uh, in, into the, the, our network. Um, so we've always been a very broad church, even though many of the first sort of most active members belonged to the transition movement, many did not and came from very different um, uh, perspectives. But what, one of the first things we did, we, we, we organized annual get togethers and I think it was our second annual get together, we spent the whole day creating a shared vision of the sort of future Scotland we were actually working towards, which was one very much about um, empowered democratic communities um, and relocalized economies. Um, early on, we, we were very clear that um, we weren't talking about just tweaking business as usual. Um, we we're clear that business as usual were actually part of the problem. Uh, and we needed really fundamental systems change in order to get to where we needed to be. Um, and we, we drew a lot of inspiration from transition conferences. Um, this was an early conference in Stirling where we were looking at systems change. Um, we did a lot of things in different ways, I suppose, from a lot of more conventional organizations organizing conferences. And, and we got a, a very positive response from most of the participants, even though they're coming from quite a, a wide range of backgrounds. Um, so yeah, in, in brief, the way we see systems change happening is that we're aware there's a lot of very interesting, innovative work happening on the ground in communities. And we saw our role as connecting up these pioneers building networks, um, helping them to support each other, form communities of practice, and really create a new system from the bottom up. Um, so at this stage, we have, uh, I'm not sure what the final figure at the moment actually is, but it's something like 350 communities across Scotland, community organisations are, are members of our network. Uh, all across Scotland, obviously a huge concentration in the central belt. Um, we also now have a lot of individual members. We were aware that um, a lot of groups, the sort of gatekeeper contact we had wasn't necessarily allowing information to filter through to the, their own membership. So we encouraged individuals to join as well. 
Um, but our ambition has always been to become a network of networks. Uh, we've always been aware that um, uh, the, the key resource held across the, the membership was really the, the knowledge which is held by, by our members. And we're wanting to find ways to enable those members to talk directly to each other. And one way we wanted to do that was to set up more local networks by geography. Uh, so that there's more direct peer-to-peer -peer networking at, at all levels. Uh, I'm not sure how successful we've been in that so far, but in terms of regional networks, the, the longer standing one is Fife Community Climate Action Network, um, which really got a big boost when we were able to invest uh, just a one, one day a week person with some lottery funding uh, about seven years ago now. Uh, and that's uh, done a huge amount to build local links with, with the council and with the wider third sector and public sector, uh, private sector and so on. Uh, Northeast Scotland Climate Action Network is more recent, uh, building on the work of Aberdeen Climate Action, uh, and they've now become one of the Scottish government's first pathfinder regional community climate action hubs, uh, along with North Highlands Climate Hub. The Scottish government is wanting to roll out, out a national network of climate hubs to support community climate action over the next year or so. Uh, we're also establishing communities of interest. Uh, one in particular is the Storytellers Collective, which is really just get, getting going, uh, which is trying to find stories of positive stories of an alternative future, which is already coming into being and joining them up, uh, and also change the narrative um, around what the future could hold. Uh, in terms of um, Reaching out, we, we early on became active members of the Scottish Community Alliance, which is itself, well, itself brings together 23 different community networks across Scotland. We were very keen to get climate action out of its environment silo. Um, and, and to some extent, we are managing to do that through our involvement with the Scottish Community Alliance. And, and now most of the members of this alliance see addressing the climate emergency as core to their agendas. Um, Sembo Scotland, I've already mentioned, we work closely with the, the, the Ethnic Minority Environmental Network, which they host, uh, and developing links with, for example, Creative Carbon Scotland. We link closely with Stop Climate Chaos Scotland, which is links together campaigning organisations. Uh, and then we, we, we're members of Ecolees, which links us to European networks, and, and we're part of a transition network, which at this stage, of course, is global. Um, so what we're trying to do um, is to create just enough structure to enable um, to find that sort of sweet spot of generative emergence. Um, so we, we're always trying to stay as a sort of agile, lean organisation, which just creates enough structure to enable people to get together to do interesting stuff. And one way we're trying to achieve that is through adopting um, sociocracy. Um, and we have a constantly evolving structure, but as far as possible, most of the activity is organized now by working groups or circles, which have a lot of autonomy to get on with individual aspects of achieving our larger purpose. Uh, and that's all coordinated by the general circle. Uh, and at this stage, we, we do now have some paid staff, which is a bit of a novelty until fairly recently, we were dependent just on volunteers with a very little bit of paid freelance time. Now we actually do have some full-time staff. Um, the other aspect of sociocracy, sorry, I'm starting getting there, Sarah, I've got too many slides, um, is the processes we use, um, consent decision-making and, and being very open to feedback. So just very briefly, some of what we organize is um, community learning exchange visits, uh, a lot of skill shares um, and uh, training. Uh, a Thousand Better Stories is our storytelling project, which I already mentioned. Um, training around sociocracy, for example, for our members. Uh, skill shares around how to set up tool libraries, regular networking cafes. Uh, the Climate for Change program is something we've adopted from Australia, adapted it for Scottish conditions. We're training up facilitators for that at the moment. Um, we, we attempt to work closely with the Scottish Government, I guess that would be called linking capital. 
Um, that has its own challenges, because even though they say a lot of the right stuff, and, and this is a quote from Nicola Sturgeon, uh, a lot of the time we realize that we're actually um, talking at cross purposes because we're, we're coming from a totally different worldview and mindset. So that brings its own challenges. Um, but for me, what is important about being part of the network is, is really just working with other like-minded people it is crucial for my own sanity. Uh, but also I'm aware that um, I, I don't think I've ever really had an original idea in my life. Uh, and so being part of the network, I'm able to pick up ideas from other people, other places, uh, and then start local projects through adapting them for local use. So I will stop there. I was anticipating running a, a workshop, so it's mostly about getting other people to start. So I don't have a, a present other people to speak. So I don't have a presentation as such, but I will explain what we're doing and kind of the, the, the way in which we're formulating what we're doing. So the Scottish Government has an ambition to create climate action hubs that cover the whole of Scotland. And they hope that by um, sort of next financial year, there will be hubs coming into existence. And they have this vision of it being a place where people can share learning, where some little bits of funding can be distributed and where government, local government um, and national government can communicate through to community groups and, and the community groups can have their voices amplified and it can be a kind of communication avenue, if you like. So in the anticipation of these hubs, we've been asked to set up networks that again will in time cover the whole of Scotland. We've taken a regional approach because there is significant differences across Scotland as there is with any country. But you know, just to give you an example, we've got someone creating a network in the Western Isles where the majority language is Gaelic, where the um, sort of dominant ideas or traditional ideas about land ownership aren't, aren't focused on maybe the capitalist structure of humans owning land. It's more based on a kind of a concept of Dulcus, which is um, a Gallic word where people belong to the land. So we, we're working with people in the West Niles, but we're also working with people in Glasgow, people in Edinburgh, um, to create regional networks where we've, we've, we, within sensible organizing spaces, so we recognize the huge value that Zoom has brought to organizing, but we also recognize that, um, that there are set segments of the population that don't, aren't online as much. If there's people with literacy issues, some folk with disabilities find it more difficult, not less difficult. Um, there's, there's various communities which are not as engaged online or find it very expensive. It's beyond their abilities to, to pay for the, connectivity for the whole family and things like that. Or particularly in Scotland, there's some very rural areas where connectivity is um, somewhere uh, worse than appalling at times. <laughs> so we're trying to create spaces that are practical organizing spaces that aren't too expensive in terms of carbon costs, time costs, money costs to travel around, where people can meet face to face. So we're also looking at transport links because, for example, if you stay on one of the islands, your ferry will come into a spot. So connecting up to your neighbouring island actually might be more difficult than connecting to the mainland and people might come to the mainland to do their shopping. So we're trying to create all these considerations in the networks that we're creating, but we've made it very clear that it's for um, the folk we're working with, the, the community groups within the region, to decide themselves how big this region should be, what, what the network should look like. And it does seem to be kind of naturally emerging as people that were maybe outside our original ideas. And then they're saying, well, you know, our kids come to this particular town for high school. So therefore it's a natural route for us and it's a natural connection for us. So we're in the very early stages. We've got people, the, the longest member serving member of staff is a who's a network coordinator has been in post for two weeks. So it is early days in ter terms of creating these connections, but I think we're very aware that 
the networks themselves have to have purpose and, and participation needs to be as wide as possible, well beyond the usual suspects. We are trying to create transformational change and sort of narrow definitions of who can participate that in that is, is totally inappropriate. So how do we listen? How do we listen to what people need? How do we engage with people so that they see a value and purpose in what we're creating? Um, we know that knowledge keeps on getting lost. I've been involved in projects where, where we did really groundbreaking um, retrofits 10 years ago, got 86% carbon emission reductions. And when I'm speaking to people now, 10 years on, people have never heard of it because the funding disappeared from that project and therefore there was no funding to host or continue to support the case studies. So how do we create an environment where people can share knowledge peer to peer within the networks, but also between the networks so that you know, if you found that community that set up a community renewables project and now they've recognised that people are really struggling with public transport, so they've bought the community electric minibus and that now gets charged from the community hydro. Um, there's all kinds of lessons um, that we can be sharing and amplifying. So I think we're looking at how we listen engage and engage, how we share our knowledge and experience, what works, what doesn't, but also what communication strategies work and what don't how we support each other, how we amplify and elevate each other, and how we create and hold a space where all are welcome and can participate. So, um, as I said, we're in the very early stages of cr creating these networks within an existingly strong st structure um, in the shape of SCAN. So, um, I think it's a case of watch the space, but I'm very much hoping that we will create something that's very different from the, you know, the sum of the parts is so much different from just the parts. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. That's really exciting to hear that and to be sort of in at the start. Um, and I just, I really loved what you were saying about um, needing to flow with natural, you know, naturally occurring patterns of, of movement and connection. So the main point is that this, the context for this work is this coalition, right? So it's people working on these three strands, not just the environmental, but the community wealth building, political decentralization and, envir and the environmentalism. Um, if you go to the next slide, please, Rich. So essentially, thanks to Transition Network, um, we got some money from the National Lottery to run experiments um, that support community empowerment um all over the uk really so this is one of three experiments which are happening um one in hull one in bristol and this one in wandsworth and what we're doing here is we're supporting transition town tooting um oh wait yeah great let's stay on that one uh, we're supporting the transition town tooting to look into the development of a network um of organizations um, in Wandsworth, basically. And I'll say a little bit more about the network in a minute, but just to say that we're um, partnering also with the Alternative UK, which has a methodology and approach for building citizen action networks that we're inspired by for this work. And we're also working with Andy Pace, um, who basically focuses on increasing democratic participation and the tools that we can use for that and we'll dive into the tools that um, that he's sharing with us uh, for this exercise in a minute so if we go to the next slide I, I guess what one of the points I want to get across is when we're thinking about what kind of people we want to bring in it's really two we have two categories in mind one of them is people who are currently activists um, in a whole range of well a, a holistic um, spectrum of fields so we want to bring in the you know the activists or the actionists in the environmental space, in the political decentralization, in the community wealth building or the economic space. But we also are hoping to bring in people who are working in other issue areas, such as lifelong education, um, regenerative justice and health, and also um, artists, people working on co-creative culture, on you know, the essence of community building, 
which is about relating to each other with love and compassion and how you know art is essentially the glue that enables that so we we want to bring together a holistic coalition of actionists is the point of this slide and we um and also yeah to go so you're anyways we'll go on to the next one please um but at the same time we also we need to be a bit opportunistic about the organizations that we're going to involve in this exercise. So we're leveraging Transition Town Tooting's existing connections. Um, and what you have here is a list of the organizations that we're thinking of reaching out to. And I should say that the reason disclaimer is there is because this is what we're thinking about doing, but we haven't yet had the conversation with these organizations to see if they're up for this exercise. But the colors basically represent the different um, issue areas that that these organizations are involved in. There's some which are communities of place, so organizations which um, have been working across the spectrum of issues for a particular community of place, for example, the big local Battersea, which has multiple colors there, and some which are focused mainly on the environment, such as uh, the Climate Emergency Center at the bottom of the list. Other ones which are more around um, arts and creativity, such as the Battersea Art Center. So yeah, um, these are the people that we're thinking of inviting to be part of this exercise. And the idea is, if we go on to the next slide, um, that we want to basically get them into a room together so that we can start talking about what we could be doing together um, and how we could be acting together to support each other, but also to ask them to connect us to, to diverse communities within Wandsworth. And the idea is that we'll have a, a, an event sometime in the autumn, um, which should be a fun and engaging event with arts and food um, to bring together 100 people that should represent the diversity of Wandsworth, whether we're talking about age groups, nationality, faith, um, interest groups, um, income levels. We want to invite lots of people to be part of this conversation. And so we're going to be asking these um, community organizations that you see on the left to help us contact these diverse tribes, as it were, within um within Wandsworth and basically we and invite them to this fun event for the purpose of creating connection and finding out what it is exactly that we have in common or that these these this group of people have in common um so that they can begin acting together for social change and one of the tools that we want to use for that is called polis um which is we'll go on to a, a video um in a moment but essentially it's a a piece of tech i guess it's a software um that is a survey software that allows people to um not only respond to a survey but to generate their own statements and what's really powerful about this is that um it allows people to essentially um, have more control over the actual questions that are being asked in the survey so that it's not all dictated by the ones by the people who designed the survey um, and this has been used in various political contexts and what's really great about it is it allows us to find areas of common ground and so we want to engage these diverse tribes of Wandsworth um, and ask them to take part of this survey so that we can find the areas of commonality between them. And then when we come to this fun event, be like, guys, so this is, you know, despite you you coming from very different parts of, of Wandsworth or having very different contexts um, of your lives or your interests, these are the things you have in common and use that common ground as a starting point for conversation of what we can do together. So, yeah, um, if we could have the video, please, that's where Andy's um, 
going to explain how this survey software works. Andy Pace and I'm working with Carolina and others in the project in Wandsworth for bringing together a wide range and diverse group of people across the local population to work on uh, actions for social change. And uh, we're going to be starting that whole project off using um, a tools that are called wiki surveys and one in particular that's called polis and I'm going to talk you through what wiki surveys are and particularly focusing on on this tool called polis in this little presentation so wiki surveys what are they a wiki survey is a kind of interactive poll that can be thought of as a survey that's created by the people themselves that are taking it that's really important because it means that the survey is not built on the assumptions of those that created it. It's actually very bottom up. It means that everybody who's participating in the survey at the same time is shaping it and not only shaping it for everybody's inputs, but also is shaping the results of it as well. First of all, we're going to look at Polis. So this is an artificial intelligence powered engagement platform and it identifies areas of consensus. So as we've seen, it's a survey created by the people taking it. It's really a tool that maps. It looks, it maps differences of opinion and sees how a community is thinking on an issue. So it, it, it identifies different clusters of, of, of opinion. And it gathers, analyzes, and understands what large groups of people think in their own words. It's also open source and free to set up and use. Although at the moment we're just working through some issues, there are some GDPR issues that means that in the UK and Europe at the moment, um, it uh, has data servers in the US. So uh, that means that we're gonna have to look into how to sort that out in, in Europe. But um, it should be sorted out soon and open and available for free use soon by everyone here. How does it work? It conducts a cluster analysis of results to understand not just the average view, but whether there are distinct clusters of opinion. And it uses algorithms uh, to generate an opinion landscape. So people with similar sets of responses are clustered near each other, and it also identifies majority opinions and points of consensus. What Polis looks like um, in reality, if you go on and actually vote and use it, this is for a conversation from the US which is all about um, $15 an hour for a minimum wage. And uh, people have submitted their statements what they think about introducing a $15 an hour minimum wage. So this person has said, higher wages makes it super hard for small businesses to survive. In effect, mum and pop coffee shops will disappear. So I can either agree, disagree or pass on each statement. So I'm going to say I disagree with this one and then new statements come up. This is going to lead to robots. Um, I don't know. Maybe I disagree. I can pass. So there's a whole series of statements that then presents itself and bit by bit um, this looks at the patterns of voting for each person that's voting and it actually sorts each person out into a cluster group and it starts to map out in an opinion landscape. Another thing you can do is if you don't see that your own opinion is represented, you can actually share your own perspective here. You just type it in and then you submit and that then others can vote on your statement. And an interesting thing here, you come to the bottom, you can see this visualization here. So it shows you how the different clusters, the different groups have uh, voted. So this is one uh, conversation from the US. I'm going to show another one here which is now closed but this was in the UK Wigan Town Centre Development. Should the people of Wigan have more of a say about um, town centre development? And you can see here once again it's created this visualization. So there are two kinds of clusters, two tribes of opinion if you like. <clears throat> if we look at group A, we click on that and we go down here, we can see the kinds of statements that characterize this group A. So it says here, demolition of the galleries is environmental vandalism. 87% of those in group A agreed with that, whereas we look at group B, the majority here, this red 
shows that they disagreed. So this shows these differences, these tribes of opinion around these statements. Wigan Council do not represent Wigan people. They're more bothered about how they look as a council than what matters to those living there. So you can see here, those are agreeing, those are disagreeing. So these generally, this group A seems to be kind of against or, or not favourable towards Wigan Council, whereas this perhaps more favourable towards Wigan Council. So you can see here that, that this is uh, showing a bit of sort of polarisation, which we tend to accept in normal life. You know, we, see, we hear about polarisation all the time. But a great thing about Polis is that it also shows us where we have commonalities, where we're not divided, where we're united in our opinion. So the majority opinions. I'd like to see a town centre where children, families and older people can all be together, doing things together. Should be more independent shops. Good town centre needs a market, shops and cafes. So you can see the, the great thing about Polis is it identifies those statements where there's a high consensus between people, which can be really useful for the beginnings of deeper conversations um, around you know the areas that we we do share common ground so uh, that gives you a little bit of a flavor of, of how polis works in practice thing about polis is it creates these reports that at any moment you can see in real time uh, how people are voting and it gives you a lot of really useful information it shows you how di divisive the conversation with was so this is a really interesting phenomena that happens nearly every time you run a Polis conversation is on this side, to the right hand side, you can see the statements that were divisive and on this side you have the statements that were more consensus and that uh, brought people together. So the interesting thing here is you can see about this conversation is that there's many more statements around here that people agree on than disagree on and the interesting thing is that this phenomena seems to repeat itself again and again and again that there are many more statements that people agree on than they actually disagree on and this is called a bee swarm chart and um, yeah no matter what topic is this seems to uh, be the general pattern so it's a general phenomenon that we don't see for example in social media we're always seeing how polarized and divided we are but in fact there's so much that people actually do agree on and that's what's really helpful for studying conversations that can really bridge divides survey that I want to show you and this is called All Our Ideas so you find it on allourideas.org and it is to help a community prioritize so uh, lots of ideas can be inputted and it will give you a kind of ranking of all those different ideas that come in and what it does it will throw up two alternatives each time and each time you have to choose which one you think is better so this was a conversation that was set up by uh, the New York City mayor's office and the question is which do you think is better for creating a greener greater New York City so let's have a look at a few here. End the practice of police using public sidewalks near station houses as their private parking lots. Increase the frequency of community meetings on sustainability. I reckon this one is going to be better. So I click that one. So this is about enforcing 30 miles per hour speed limits or replacing lights with LED. I don't know. Let's try this one. So here we can also click I, don't, I can't decide. So you can see it's a similar principle. If you can't decide, you say why you don't like, why you can't decide. I just can't decide. And the same principle is here is you can add in a new idea. So you could we could say promote, I don't know, green walls in the city. And submit that. And that will go in then for others to vote in. So it's a similar idea and here immediately you can click on this view results and you can see what people have voted on and what people think is the top idea. So it's the top idea is about continuing to enhance the bike lane network and it gives you um, the scores there on the side. So another example of a wiki survey that you can use in your communities to, to prioritize and work out what you want to work on a quick tour of wiki surveys and how they can be used to 
uh, find common ground to build relationships across divides and uh, find common ways forward and these are tools that I've been using in my work in participatory democracy setting up things like citizens assemblies and community assemblies and um, I found them to be very useful and hope that Pretty sure that was the end. I think it was a repetition of the beginning. Yeah, he was just saying thank you. <laughs> that was it. And the context in which he uses them. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. I saw a number of comments in the chat. Um, really interesting, your description of the project and then, then this particular piece of tech. Um, what I'm going to suggest we do is I'll just, I've got, tiny bit of input so we'll, we'll we'll do that as well and then we can just spend whatever time's left having whatever conversation we want to have so what I was planning to do in my little breakout session was to try something out really I, I just spent a bit of time yesterday thinking about uh, thinking about what I know about good governance I think about governance as the structures the, the processes, the practice, the underpinning culture and behaviours that support people to collaborate well together. That's, that's my little definition that I use. And I was thinking, well, of all the things I know about governance, what might be key elements of good network governance? And I came up with a list uh, and uh, I'm not suggesting that this is the right list, but I thought I'd sort of share it with you and see what you think. And uh, I bet I've, you know, I bet I've missed things off that even I would have thought of. And uh, so there will be loads, there's loads of other things that you may want to contribute. But these were a few that came up for me. Um, And the first, so quite a lot of this is about clarity. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, if you're, if you're trying to work in a distributed way, where are the areas where the more clarity and transparency you have, it helps, well, it sort of um, helps power to flow in a way and rather than flow around the network rather than getting stuck in particular places or sort of working underneath the radar um, in ways that people aren't quite sure what's happening, but they they know that they're not really um, able to, they, they're not feeling empowered. So the different pieces of clarity, the was, first was about clarity about container. This is a word um, some people use and maybe doesn't mean much at all to others, uh, but you know, who's in, who's in, who's in this network, who can join, how do they join? Uh, I think there's sort of layers beneath that about how are they welcomed? How are they sort of, how are they um, informed about how the network operates? Also, how do people leave? Is there clarity when people leave or do they just sort of disappear? Um, are there clear expectations about what membership involves? Are there actually requirements for membership? And how are people held accountable to those? Are they? You know, is there a need to hold people accountable? And if there is a need, how does that work? Uh, we often talk about this in governance, but clarity, and we've already talked about it in the session, clarity of purpose. What's the network for? Why are we connecting? And, you know, again, that sort of bird's eye view of why is a network a good way of achieving that purpose as opposed to all the other ways that we could go about it so the more there is that sort of clarity then I think it it, it helps build the trust that you know we're working on the for the same purpose uh, so we don't need to be constantly monitoring each other we know that that we we we've got a common endeavor clarity of roles uh, what roles are needed for the network to thrive um, are they visible are they are they named or do they just sort of happen under the surface? Um, how do people end up in those roles? Is it, do they inherit them? Do they take them? Uh, are they voted for? Um, and how and when do those roles get transferred to new people? I mean, there's loads more I could say about that, but I'm not going to because I'm supposed to do sh short input. Uh, clarity about decisions. You know, it, it may be that there's not much decision making that needs to happen in this decision in this network, but there will be some decisions made. And if and who makes those and how? 
and we touched on earlier about the different forms of decision making that there are that can um, uh, uh, sorry I got distracted by the chat then don't, don't let myself do that um, uh, yes uh, and, and, and I think there is a, a piece that we've often explored within Transition Network is when, if ever, does the network need to have a collective position on something, you know, and where can it be open to the fact that there are different perspectives, different approaches um, with sort of encompassed within the network. I think that that relates to what you were saying earlier, Phil, about, you know, where's the difficult territory and do you need to go there? And it also that whole piece about polis really makes me think, you know, is that where there is a need for to find the commonality? You know, that's a really interesting uh, tool to support you to do that. Um, there's something for me. And um, again, this is one of my uh, passions, but, but about viewing it as relational, valuing the relationships that are part of it, the human relationships, whether those are uh, supported by appearing through tech um, or in person, but recognizing that this is all about uh, relationships and, and looking at how our practices and that as a network, the spaces we create, the way we use our time, the way we communicate, um, the way we support people to get to know each other, to find their common interests, um, and also be curious about what's, what they can learn from each other, where they don't know about something, where they have different perspectives, how they can get curious about that rather than dismissive. Um, you know, all of that for me um, adds up to fostering an inclusive, collaborative uh, culture. And the final one I put was um, ability to evolve, adapt. Um, you know, how can these structures, these processes, the roles, et cetera, how do they adjust in response to a changing context? Um, and how do we, as a network, how do we invite feedback about what's working, what isn't working, and notice when something needs to adjust? Uh, so those were my questions, and I'll um uh, those were my that's my list and these were some of the questions that I was planning to explore um looking at those elements and also opening up to the idea of what else might be on uh, people's list and I will just share oh yeah David's already done it my slides so those slides include the stuff that I shared at the beginning of this session and and this most recent one thanks David Excellent technical support going on here. <laughs> okay, so let's all let's all take a breath after that little bits of input, and uh, we've got just got um, a few minutes late left, eight minutes left. But I'm I'm really interested in anything that's sort of staying with you, either from those three inputs or. Um, from uh, earlier conversations, anything that you're that's you're you're still feeling burning to say about uh, networks and how to support them. I'll kick off. Um, I'm a little bit conscious about how um, uh, uh, nobody wants to be in somebody else's gang. <laughs> uh, we're in all our, our gang and we're all comfortable with that because we know each other and. Um, so then when somebody comes along and says, oh, we're going to start a network, um, uh, what, what are the sort of cunning ways to actually make it as open-hearted as possible? Um, and, and it's for Phil as well, and, and Nick as well, to, to how, how are we able to sort of set it so that, um, as in Herefordshire, you're getting the more traditional organisations getting involved uh, as well as the activists, I think it was called. Um, um, so th th that's really a question in my mind because, and, and it leads on to how do we achieve democratic accountability for that? Um, in in traditional organ, you know, NGOs, you elect a committee and then uh, and so on, and they've got a constitution and and so on. But a network is often 
sort of unincorporated initially anyway. And, and so any tips and ideas that anybody's got um, on how to uh, invite people into the space in a way that uh, is open-hearted and effective. Did I make a couple of comments based on Herefordshire? I mean, I think what changed for us was that the alignment happened because other organisations were beginning to adopt similar targets. So the county, the church, uh, the farming community, they they're all looking at adopting, you know, carbon neutral targets. And most of them are 2030. The farming one is 2040. But so it, it gave us a, a, an opening for a dialogue with them and said, well, how can we work with you to produce this critical mass? Um, the second thing we're in the process of doing is setting up the network as a CIO, a charitable incorporated organization, simply because we've been handling small amounts of money um, because we have two part-time staff who are amazing, but we did need a legal structure, A, to enable us to bid for some of that, and B, to remove the possibility that those of us who sign the contracts are professionally liable if things go pear-shaped. So, um, but what we are adamant about is that the CIO is there to support the network. It's not there to deliver carbon action plan. So it's still about how we enable the members of the network to have their, their meetings, their support, how we get the newsletter going. It isn't about us being yet another organization that is trying to, to deliver. Um, we, we want to deliver change on the ground, but through the members of the network, not as a separate entity, if that makes sense. Thank you, Carolina. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, for me, I think the key is in actually what you said to be open hearted. I think so much of the time when we meet in these kinds of spaces, we're meeting as representing a particular organization or a particular issue, and we're not really meeting as humans. Um, we're not really meeting as, you know, this is Carolina, this is how I'm feeling today, like we're not really being real. So it's about trying to find like this genuine human connection with people. And once you build that, then you have trust. And for, once you have trust, you can do anything. Um, it takes time though. But something that's really recurring in the work that we're doing is this need to meet as humans and not by, not like the organizations that we're representing. Um, yeah, and develop a heartfelt connection. So just wanted to add that into there. Uh, and the thing is about roles. So I really noticed in my own, like last three, three to five years, I guess that period being very active in the London hub and then going, actually, I'm gonna step out and have a smaller role. Um, of like this idea or this temptation to go, oh, I'm doing all of this locally, or this is all my action and activity. Um, and uh oh it would be even better if we could how do we take this to scale i know let's build a network around this okay i can see it, feel the value of that so i'm going to put some energy into that on top of all that i do so there's something about honoring the role that a network takes on and going actually maybe the thing that i do is offer the network space maybe that's what i do and so i don't have to start a transition town where i am i don't have to do this and this and this and this as well what i'm offering is this collective space and that is a has huge value if it's done well if i can step through that well so i guess what i'm saying is a little bit about giving ourselves a break in terms of how much there is to do you know this piece about overwhelm pushing towards um uh, burnout and that kind of thing and looking in the mirror and going, actually, yeah, network building is my piece, is what I really enjoy. I can do it well. I'm really interested and passionate about it. And so that's what I'm going to offer, offer this movement in whatever way, whether it's voluntary or paid. Um, yeah, that feels really important and calls to that piece about welcoming people in because then the network is held well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's me. Well, I think I guess what I would... I'd complement that by saying I think there are particular skills and particular roles and people who are, who are really excited by networks who will do more of that holding but I also think it's worth us being a little bit wary of the idea of 
creating a network from one point in the system and you know and then inviting in others and I was hearing some of that in what you were saying Dick of for me some of the most thriving networks are where you know it's about conversations that are happening it's about relationships that are forming and needs that are being expressed and then and 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 the network sort of is arising and then how do how do we create space and time and tech that that supports those conversations and that collaboration to go to another level um rather than feeling like we're you know we're yeah creating something uh outrageously oh no phil go ahead i didn't want to give myself yeah, the last wanted... word so give it thank to you me. yeah sorry I, I, and it's this idea of you know just kind of what you were saying then it's this idea of is the network inevitable you know do, do we have to create this network because sometimes we make decisions where we it's what i said before about why are we collaborating why, why are we actually sitting around here are we trying to force this or are we in service of the inevitability of the network creating itself and i think they're two different so you could try and force an issue and not really get anywhere because the need doesn't really exist it seems obvious that we connect and we work together but that question itself i don't think is as obvious as it actually seems so you know it, it's that basically why are we doing this are we doing this because we think it's the right thing to do or are we doing this because we've got no choice but to do this it's inevitable that this will happen so and i think that's a distinction we need to make as well thank you phil i really love that as a place to to bring this session to a close uh, I want to really appreciate everybody's contribution.